Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here and get a chance to share some work with you. Um, you can see the title, the very long title for this talk, because I've had a long career. <laughs> so in preparing for this, uh, actually, I, I came across a paper that Jeremy Rapelli sent me uh, by Ono Fumio on the salience in the Kyoto School of Philosophy of the concept of Rinsho. I hadn't been aware of this before, but let's just look at some quotes here. The effort to philosophize an ordinary language by philosophers who inherited the tradition of the Kyoto School have recently been made in the development of the idea of the clinical, or Rinsho. They all intend to express their theoretical and practical activities as clinical. So I won't read them all. I'll give you a second to look at them. Are these familiar ideas here in Kyoto? Does anyone know Ono Fumio? So the top here, it's a, this connection of theory and practice intrigues me. And the third quote there, the connection to everyday life. It's always hard to know how much time people need to read. Is that enough? So I begin with these quotes because they introduce a key tension I've been struggling with throughout my career as an anthropologist who studies Japanese early childhood education. As I was reading this essay by Ono, it occurred to me that my ethnographic research can be considered to be a form of Rinsho Kyoiku. Ono Fumio points out that several leading figures in the Kyoto school were clinicians, including the psychoanalyst Kimura Bin and Kawai Hayao. Perhaps my attraction to research grounded in clinical practice can be traced back to my personal history, growing up as the son of a psychoanalyst, and then being mentored early in my career by the psychoanalyst Doi Takeo, whose work on Amai grew out of his clinical practice. So Ono points out that the notion of Rinsho challenges the theory-practice binary. Such questioning with theory-practice binary is the key theme for my talk. I, I'm going to employ some... In my work, I employ some well-known Japanese and Western theorists, but only in small doses. This kind, the kind of theories I emphasize instead are those which are located in the practices and beliefs of practitioners, and which are often tacit and embodied. In this talk, I'm going to give examples of methods I've used in my studies to elicit and elucidate these tacit embodied constructs. I'm also going to reflect on what kind of effects work like mine hopes to produce both for non-Japanese and Japanese readers. We anthropologists have a saying, anthropology makes the strange familiar and the familiar strange. Following this dictum as a researcher, I present my non-Japanese readers with the meaningfulness of aspects of Japanese educational practice that at first strike them as strange. And then I strive to defamiliarize their taken for granted assumptions about teaching and learning. At the same time, this work may have the effect for Japanese readers of coming to see familiar pr educational practices in a new light. Okay, so that's the beginning, the, my, my task I'm giving myself. The next section here I call learning from the Kyoto School, or learning from 30, almost 40 years of learning from Kyoto senseis. But no, not, not the Kyoto School you're thinking of. <laughs> not... Uh, Kyoda, I know, sensei, but uh, Komatsudani Hoikuen, sensei. So it's going to be another, at the other end of the philosopher's path, down by uh, near Kiyomizu, there's a small temple called uh, Komatsudani, and they have a Hoikuen. And much of what I know and, uh, and much of what I've written about happened in that little temple. So in night, here's how I got there. By the way, here's, there's Komatsudani and Yoshizawa, the priest and director of the temples, retired, but his, he's still alive and his son is now the director. So how did I end up at Komatsudani? So in 1981, I completed my PhD in anthropology and human development in Chicago. And the job I got was at an overseas program in Kyoto. And I enrolled my four-year-old son in a Yochien uh, called Senzan Yochien. And his experience that year was so interesting 
and so much different than his experience the year before in, in a preschool in Chicago that I decided to change my research agenda. And from then on, and he's now 42, so since then I've been looking at Japanese preschools as, um, as that's been my research agenda with the idea as an anthropologist that they're cultural in two ways. One, preschools can be a window on, other, on Japanese culture. Anthropologists always study in some community, some village, some institution. And I decided the preschool was more interesting than other institutions I've been looking at. But also they're cultural in the sense that preschools are given the charge of, of being a place where Japanese kids learn to be Japanese. American kids learn to be American, et cetera. So I decided, I, after a year in Kyoto, we moved to Hawaii where I had a postdoc at the East West Center and my sponsor, the Chinese anthropologist David Wu, was just back from studying the first generation of single children in China. So we decided to do a comparative study of Chinese and U.S. preschools from an anthropological perspective. But then we thought it's kind of strange to be studying Chinese and Japanese preschools from the U.S. without bringing the U.S. into the study. And I think that was an important um, contribution to the study. So we invited an American child development person, Dana Davidson, to join us. And that became eventually what we call a, a book, Preschool in Three Cultures. So some seven years after David Wu and I came up with this idea, we came out with this book. So here's how we got to that point. So we developed a research method which we called video cued multi vocal ethnography. Almost nobody calls it that. They sometimes call it the preschool and three cultures method or just video cued interviewing. But the way it works is we, um, we made videotapes. We decided we'd make a videotape of a more or less typical day in a preschool, Hoikuen, in China and Japan and the U.S. And right away, people are thinking, well, how could that, you claim that Hoikuen is typical? Well, we don't claim that. No. So the idea was that the video would not be data. The video would be a cue. So usually anthropologists spend time in the field with people, they notice things, and then they say, tell me about that. So what we decide to do is use the video as the conversation starter, as a cue to get people talking. So we videotaped a day in a preschool. We reduced the tape to 20 minutes because that's enough material to get people talking a long time. We then showed the video first to the classroom teacher, and we interviewed her. Then we showed it to her colleagues, and then we took it to other preschools around the country. And then we took the, the video we made at Komatsudani to the U.S. and China, and we showed the Chinese and, Japanese and American videos in Japan. So it became a virtual multinational, multicultural conversation where you have, we had something like 600 people all talking about the same three 20-minute videos. So... Let me, sh rather than keep talking about it, let me show you what it looks like. So this is the courtyard at Komatsudani Hoikuen. It's just one of the temple buildings. The kids, that, like at most Hoikuen, arrive starting at 7 in the morning as they're dropped off by their working parents. And then the formal school day doesn't really start till about 9 with morning opening. But the first hour or two, as kids are arriving, kids are free to play inside and out. And at Komatsudani, when we were there, a lot of the, old, the four- and five-year-old girls would go to the nursery each morning and grab their favorite baby and take them out to play. So you see a girl coming down the steps with this baby. So... So here's how the method works. So we showed this in other scenes, but with this scene, we'd show it and we'd say, what do you think? And so when we showed it to, uh, Amer when, we show when we showed it to Americans, they had this kind of concern. Well, the concern was, oh my God, someone's going to drop a baby. And aren't you worried you're going to get sued? And do the parents know what you're doing? Um, so the American reactions tell us some more about America than they do about Japan, right? But 
my colleague Dana Davidson asked the assistant director, Higashino, this. Do you encourage? She thought, oh, I bet you do this because you're worried about kids not getting atten enough attention. But Higashino, the assistant director, said, no. Like, no, you idiot. <laughs> no. The babies are so cute, they get plenty of attention. It's the older children for whom this activity is valuable. These older children in our era of low birth rates don't have enough, don't have younger siblings, and as a result, they lack opportunities to develop omoyati and to learn how to know and anticipate the needs of another. So this is an example of the method produced kinds of insights that uh, we didn't already have going in. This taking care of babies wasn't necessarily common in Hoikuen across the country, but the logic is what was common. So the practice wasn't common, but this tatewari kyoiku, or older kids playing with younger kids, and especially this concern about omayari with single children and families who have less social complexity, was what was the more common theme. So one more example. This is the scene that that was most, gets the most attention from the Preschool and Three Cultures book. This boy, this bad, naughty boy, Hiroki, I owe my career to him. Boy in the yellow shirt, oh. Satoshi. So I'll just tell you what's happening here. So the boy in the yellow shirt, we call Satoshi, has taken his aluminum foil from lunch and made a shuriken, a little, as you do, right? And he's going to reach over to Hiroki in blue, in blue and say, look what I made, but Hiroki's going to step on his hand. The teacher's nearby, but doesn't do anything, but Midori to the rescue. And Midori takes... Satoshi over to some other girls, and Midori had witnessed this, and she explains, Hiroki hit him and then stepped on his hand. And then the other girl, she says, right, isn't that what happened? And then the other girl says, that always happens when you play with Hiroki. If you don't want to get hurt, play with someone else next time. So we then showed this, this to the priest and director, Yoshizawa Hidenori, and he says, children's fighting isn't a problem. If there were no fights, now that would be a problem. The world of the Japanese child is becoming narrow. Hoikuen should be a place where young children in modern Japan experience a social complexity lacking in their everyday lives. We don't encourage children to fight, but if fights occur, well, that might be for the best. And the best thing we could do might be to not rush in to break them up. So let me stop here to make some observations about how this method works. You've now seen two of the scenes. Um, so there's a couple of features of the video cued ethnography. One, the videos work to get Japanese cultural insiders to think and talk about implicit beliefs and practices that, un that otherwise would not be easy to talk about. So the emphasis of, in the method is on privileging the voice of the insiders to the culture, the teachers and the directors. So we give them a chance to explain things that usually we, people don't ask them about. So in a sense, we're viewing them as, as kind of organic intellectuals in the Marxist sense, or as, um, as philosophers with, of practice in their field. And we define praxis or pr as behavior plus intentionality. So if we just see the videos, we see behaviors. But we need to also show the videos to people and have them talk about why they're doing what they're doing before we would call it praxis. Because people could come up with all sorts of their own guesses about what's happening. But when we hear the explanation of the teachers, we get it becomes something else. No, not just behavior, but praxis. I also want to point out that we designed this method out of concern with some ethical and epistemological problems of anthropology. Most ethnographies are of just one other culture, which implicitly positions the culture being studied as exotic. Oh my gosh. And the culture being, the culture of the anthropologist is the norm, and the culture you're studying is the exotic. But by putting three cultures, including our own, into the same study and having them all be studied through the same methods, it doesn't eliminate, but it more evens the playing field. 
Another, also by having two East Asian countries, China and Japan, in the study, we can break down this binary of East-West, which is so prevalent. Because it turns out China, I won't have time to show you this, but the Chinese preschools are no, are not, are not, are no more like the Japanese preschools than they're like the American preschools. So it challenges binary thinking. The other feature of this method is ethnographies are usually conducted in just one place, and then they, there's a danger of generalizing to the whole country or to the culture. But for us, the one, Komatsudani was the place we made the video, but we showed the video in Hiroshima, Tokyo, Osaka. And when we showed the video in different places, in Yochian and Hoikuen, in richer and poorer neighborhoods, it's the responses of the people in those neighborhoods that helped us understand variability what's more similar and what's argued about. So for instance, when we took the Komatsudani video to a Yochien in Tokyo, they started out by being very critical. First of all, they said, why do you film in Kyoto? That's not the real Japan. You know, Kyoto's, what do you mean? Well, Kyoto's unusual. It's more, it's too Buddhist and it has, the, there's a socialist tradition in the teacher's union. And so as they told us why Kyoto is a mistake, they were tel help, helping us understand some of the tensions in Japanese society. Have you heard those kinds of stereotypes? Should we have done it in Tokyo? No. <laughs> That's not the real Japan either. Uh, the other, th um, when we showed Yochien people a Hoikuen video, they said, oh, Yochien and Hoikuen are totally different. And then they started telling us their versions of what's wrong with Hoikuen and Hoikuen people, what's wrong with Yochien. So this complexity of, of intentions came out. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here. One other thing we did is we showed the, I'm going to show you, is what happens when we showed the people in Japan a videotape in the U.S. So here's a, uh, this is in Honolulu in the U.S. We have a, what's happening here is two boys, the two boys were fighting over this shovel and the teacher comes in and puts her hand on the shovel and stops the fight and you can see this dialogue. So Billy says, oh, I call him Jimmy, I had it first and put it down for just one second, but you already had a turn and you grabbed it. I wasn't done. The teacher, instead of grabbing the shovel, could you tell Billy with words you were still playing with it? I told him I had it first. When you feel mad, what can you do instead of grabbing the block? I did ask him. No, you didn't. You just grabbed it. Wait, one of you needs to talk at a time so I can understand what you're saying. You should use words instead of fighting. So we showed this. This was at Senzan Yochien. I remember the first time I showed this. Oh, first the American teacher said, what I'm trying to do is to get them to use words to use words instead of, oh, that one didn't, I'm trying to get, the American teacher said, I want them to use words instead of hitting. It's important that they learn to express their feelings verbally. But here's what the teachers at Sanzan Yochien said. So that's what the American teacher said. Yagi sensei, tsugoi, I'm like, wow, amazing. But I was like, good, tsugoi good or tsugoi bad? talking so directly with such young children about their feelings. The teacher gets right in there and deals with the problem. Talking with children about disagreement seems a bit heavy. Kind of reminds me of marriage counseling. <laughs> <laughs> so that would, it, so if, with the preschool and three cultures, I've only shared the Japan part. You know, it, there are whole treatments of the US and China as well, but um, what I want to take away from this is um, that the insights in the Japan chapter all came not with ideas I brought to the field primarily, but instead from interviews we conducted with Fukui and Kumagai and Yoshizawa and other Japanese practitioners. And I used these interviews to introduce to non-Japanese readers Japanese ima concepts and cultural pedagogies, including notions like keijime, tatewari kyoiku, omoyari, amai, did I get Japanese hoiku right? I don't claim that I did. I do claim to have presented in my writings the voices and perspectives of Japanese practitioners, voices and perspectives that challenge non-Japanese readers' assumptions and expand their notions of what's possible and desirable to do with children. Okay, next. 
So I thought I was done with that study, and I did other things for the next 10 years in the 90s. And then, after it had been almost 20 years, a young Chinese uh, a researcher, Ye Shui, approached me and said, it's time to redo the study because the Chinese preschools have changed so much. I didn't want to just repeat myself, but this was a challenge because it was a challenge to introduce a historical dimension to what had been a synchronic study, a study in one time to add time. And I, as an anthropologist, I didn't really know how to do this, so I was intrigued and challenged. I read a book around that time by Johannes Fabian, called Time and the Other, in which he argues that a fault of anthropology is it tends to freeze cultures in one period of time, in a timeless ethnographic present. As if whatever people believe now, they're going to believe in five years or ten years. So um, we created what we called, um, we did this, this became the book Preschool and Three Cultures Revisited. And the method we developed, we called video-cued video multi-vocal diachronic ethnography. So diachronic meaning in two periods of time. So we still had three cultures, Japan, China, and the US, but across two time periods. So it became a study of continuity and change. And so the method we did was to go back to the original three preschools. So I came back to Komatsudani with, a new, with new colleagues. Um, Mayumi Karasawa and Yeshue this time, and they each brought graduate students. We went back to the three preschools where we videotaped in 1985. So we went to Komatsudani and we repeated making a video again, again in the four-year-old classroom. We then also showed the preschool staff the old video, their old video. So we, made, we enlisted their help in the interpretive process. We said to them, looking at your old video, what would you say has stayed the same and changed? And we also videotaped in a new preschool in each country. And we chose one that represented a new direction. Like in Shang we went to Shanghai in China because it was seen as being a hub for the development of a new kind of economic and educational model. So let me show you a scene from the new video. This is 20 years later. This is 2003, back at Komatsudani. You probably weren't expecting to see you didn't come here expecting to see anyone peeing, did you? Um, so let me explain why this scene is here. So 20 years later, the, at Komatsudani, instead of the kids just spontaneously going and grabbing a baby in the morning, one of the teachers, the only male teacher, Nogami, instituted a policy of saying every day five of his 25 kids, on Monday five of the 25 five-year-olds would go down to the nursery and spend an hour after lunch with the babies and toddlers. So the kids put on an apron and they go downstairs. So by the way, this is a little off the topic, but I think this is some of the finest teaching I've seen at any level, all the way through doctoral programs. He's in the, it's what you need for good teaching. We have someone who's interested in the subject matter he's teaching. He knows it very well. Having, he knows his student very well. Having only recently learned to pee in a urinal, he, you could see how attuned he is to his student, right? We could say great pedagogical tact here. <laughs> And so he knows a little boy might make a mistake and keep peeing and pee on his shirt, or he knows that the boy might be afraid of the flush. So when we showed this video to the teachers at first at Komatsudani, they uh, talked about, again, how this importance of tatewari uh, kyoiku and omoyari, and that kids who don't have younger siblings, and especially boys, may be at risk of not developing a kind, the kind of empathy which... Uh, people may be developed in other ways when they had larger families and they were out spontaneously in the community. So I won't have time to get into the findings other than to say China changed a lot in those 20 years. So the China chapter is very much about change. 
Japan on the surface changed very, cha had political changes like the uh, development of the Kodomo-en policy and uh, uh, the uh, tensions between, attempt by the ministries of, of uh, education and child welfare to merge the two systems and how badly that was going. So there was, on the surface, there was, there was, there was change, but on the, at the level of pedagogy, we saw great continuity in Japan. Okay, then, oh, I forgot to show you one more scene from Japan. Here's one more, one more key scene. So we had kids playing with babies twice in the old and new. Then we had fights. So a group of girls fighting over a teddy bear. So there's the, the teachers right there. So many Americans and Chinese who watched this were very critical. They said, they said didn't the teacher see what was happening? Why wasn't she paying attention? Why did, if she saw it, why didn't she do anything? But the, when we showed it, not only at Komatsudani, but it, to hundreds of people in different sites in Japan, we got a very different reaction. Some teachers might have intervened more than others, but nobody found this holding back to be strange, whereas the Chinese and Americans just couldn't, most of them just couldn't see why this would be okay. Um, when we showed this to the teacher, Morita Chisato, here's what she said. When there's a, I, a fight among children, I watch and wait, mimamoru, and try to decide if they're really attempting to hurt each other or if it's just rough play. If it looks like it's getting too rough or might get out of control, I tell them to be less rough, but I don't want to tell them to stop. I want the children to learn to be strong enough to handle such quarrels. I want them to have the power to endure. Another director said, Japanese teachers wait because we trust children and know their abilities. So we, ended up, we use this concept of implicit cultural practices. In the implicit, we mean these are not, for the most part, written down in textbooks or in Monbusho, or Kos it's no longer Monbusho, but in uh, our Koseisho guidelines, and yet we find a great deal of um, continuity of this practice. So how does it endure? And we, so Akiko Hayashi, my, who was my student, she came on the project as a graduate student and ended up doing her dissertation on, on reanalyzing this material. She wrote this in her dissertation. I said, and she's here with us today. I suggest that in most cases when Japanese teachers talk about mimamoru, they do so not because they were taught to do so or because they consciously intend to do it, but because it seems like the right thing to do. These actions are more usefully thought of as cultural schema or forms of embedded logic than as conscious pedagogical strategies. By calling these practices implicit, I'm emphasizing their beliefs and practices widely shared and passed down from generation to generation without needing to be codified 
are explicitly taught. Okay, so that was preschool in three cultures revisited. Okay, now I'm going to present two more studies that are m more recent. The next one is called Teaching Embodied. And, um, I'll tell you how we got to that. So Akiko Hayashi, for her dissertation, reanalyzed the interviews and videos, just the Japan videos and uh, interviews from Preschool and Three Cultures Revisited. So we had hundreds of, we had 20, 40 hours of video and, and hundreds of pages, transcripts of Japanese ed teachers and directors, and we only, only a little bit of it gets into the book. So Akiko went back and looked at all of it and uncovered things we'd missed the first time around. Then she went back, based on that, re having re reviewed all the material and did new interviews, where she could focus on issues we didn't pay enough attention to. And then she also added an analysis of the videos. So I've been always arguing throughout my career, the videos aren't data. The videos are just a cue to get people talking. But Akiko pushed me on this to say, Let it, but it's also data. Let's analyze the videos as well. So there we are in a study we did actually of deaf kindergartens I won't talk about today. We show people a video on a laptop and we have them talk about what's happening there. So in the course of reviewing the video the interviews, this is Mrs. Kumagai, at Senzan, the director of Senzan Yochien, who'd been my son's preschool director 30 years earlier. She's watching that fight, this fight, and she says, look, there's a gallery. Fights are more important for the children who are not fighting. Teachers should pay attention to them and consider what they're learning. So we thought, I didn't know that. I thought it was a Japanese word, gyarari. But Akiko said, no, it's gallery. <laughs> So then we started, th what did she mean by gallery? Well, it turns out then if we go back and look at the videos, it's not just the kids fighting. Look at the girl on the left in the pink dress. We hadn't even really focused on her. The girl in the yellow. So whenever they're the boy in the red, we, all, we tend, especially as Americans perhaps, to focus on the kids we've decided are the protagonists. But the Japanese, Mrs. Kumagai introduced us to this concept of thinking beyond the, look, the unit of analysis being two individual kids fighting into seeing, you could say, this is kind of Aida Gata, you know, kind of a, we put it in Kyoto philosophy. Um, even at the end, did you notice this girl on the left there? So we ended up writing, Akiko finished her dissertation, and then I joined, invited me to be second author on turning her dissertation into a book that we published called Teaching Embodied Cultural Practice in Japanese Preschools. And um, this is so far only in, in English, but if anyone's ready to publish it in Japanese, see me after the talk. Um, and the key idea is there are two senses of embodiment. The first is a focus on how teachers literally use their body as a teaching tool. I think we're so word-oriented, we tend to make transcripts of teachers' talk and look at their reflective journals. But meanwhile, they do a lot with their bodies, especially perhaps in preschool, but not only in preschool. So that's one. The second meaning of embodiment is that it's like muscle memory. It's something you do without necessarily being conscious you're doing it. Like, I, should, I, how much eye contact do I make? Not enough. But. So this notion of embodiment, we could be related to, um, to the notion of pedagogical tact, um, which Professor Suzuki has been working on. But uh, this idea of a kind of presence in the classroom that you have without being conscious. And in fact, if you get too conscious, you'll break down because you, be, you can't be fluent while you're think too conscious. We also use these ideas from Polyani and Van Manen, but I won't, I'm going to have to skip quickly through that. So we get, we should, we're trying to not get so caught up in what people say that we don't see what they do. So that's kind of the shift towards paying attention to what people are doing. Um, so, for instance, Mimamoru in the teaching of body, we say, isn't just a belief or a practice. It's also something a teacher does by adjusting her level of attention, gaze, posture, position. 
Okay, then, but let me just show you. This is teacher Marita you saw before. She did an origami lesson, and when she watched it, she said, oh, I was in such a rush. But let me jump to this. What we did is we videotaped her in 2002. In 2015, she was back at Komatsudani with four-year-olds again in the exact same classroom. So we, Akiko and I went to back to her classroom, with, and we filmed a, the say, a whole day using the same camera angles whenever we could to try to reproduce the film. And then we took the scene, a scene that was most common between the two, origami and a paper telephone activity, and compared them. Do you see any difference? So she's still very much herself, and yet she's a different version of herself. Right? So what's different? So we first of all analyzed it, and we, when we interviewed her about showing her 2003 video, she said, yo, yo, ganai. I was too much in a rush. I, was, I talk too much. It's, I'm too full of words. I don't give the kids room. I'm implying that they need help by giving them help before they even ask for it. But, so that was how she watched her old video. But we can see that. We argued that this posture, hands behind the back, unconsciously, she wasn't aware she was doing it. But she and her Nogami, her colleagues, said, wow, look at that. This is like embodied mimamoru. It's almost like you're holding yourself back so as to resist the impulse to give more help than is necessary. So finally, so what have, kind of effects can this research hope to give? So let me go back to where I started with Rincho. I'd argue, my argument, I hope you got the point, is that practice, teachers practice, even a four-year-old classroom in a hoikoen, is a kind of knowledge, if not theory. And that these practitioners, we have to get away from the theory versus practice as a binary and see practitioners is also engaged with theory in a sense. To see a kind of continuum from the one end of the philosopher's path to the other. My primary audience has been, has been outside Japan, writing for Americans and other Anglophone readers. My advisor for my doctoral program, Robert Levine, wrote this, I've long argued that cross-cultural evidence will pose a fundamental challenge that psychoanalytic theorists must face. that they, it'll force Amer psychoanalysts outside Japan to reconsider what's normal, necessary, and adaptive. He says, I call this the Japanese problem. So what he meant was, if, if people took Jap really understood some things about Japanese pedagogy, Japanese philosophy, Japanese psychoanalysis, Japanese social structure, it might lead them to have to reconsider the taken-for-granted assumptions about what's normal or natural or inevitable. So he called that the Japanese problem. So I hope, for instance, American teachers who see a Japanese teacher using mimamoru, not intervening quite as quickly as they would, maybe the next time they're in a classroom, they'll just be a little bit slower to intervene because now they've been exposed to a different way of thinking about what they could do. For Jap what, what now my, as Jeremy said, a, a kind of a personal, Tragedy for me is that the works haven't been translated into Japanese because I'd love to have the work reach a Japanese audience. So what can this work do for Japan, this kind of work? By, it's, not, it's not just outsiders. I work with Akiko Hayashi and I've worked with other Japanese colleagues. But when you have this kind of intercultural, bicultural research team, what can it contribute, the kind of things we learn to Japan? Well, one is that I would say to the Japanese audience, there's a danger that globally circulating educational ideas are replacing local ones. Just as the, we're losing flowers and plants and animals, there's, uh, there's a homogenization of the world's plants, and there's also a, lot, a homogenization of pedagogical practices. So Japan has some rich pedagogical traditions that I think should be preserved and appreciated. So I would, one thing I would 
there's a kind of problem here, though. They, I think a lot of, even though on the surface a lot of policy changes, some pedagogical practices don't change so much because no one notices them. So once you start studying them, then they become available for the policy people to get their hands on. So I'm, there's some contradiction here, but I, would ur I urge people in Japan and China and Korea and other places to realize that, yes, be thinking about exporting and importing ideas, but also be more appreciative of your own usually implicit, tacit practices, because once these disappear, not just Japan, but the world loses something valuable. So thank you. I'll stop there. <laughs>